We're now going to take a look at how Scottish Golf plans to use digital technology to take a look at golf and the unseen areas that this can now benefit your club. Please remember, you can submit your questions through the Slido app on your phone, or through the website, sorry, on your phone. So feel free to, to engage with what is being said on the stage. And we will have a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. For now, though, I would like to introduce Ian Forsyth, Chief Commercial Officer at Scottish Golf. Thank you, Emma. Good afternoon, everybody. Don't fall asleep on me once you've had your sandwiches. So we want to look at the future. Why do we need to look at the future? Why do we need to make changes? Adoption, how people take on adoption to change. Choices, the types of choices we have in our everyday life, not just golf, our everyday life. And what's our plan? What are we going to do to move the game forward? So why do we have to do it? Eleanor mentioned earlier that 50,000 people have left the game in the last 10 years. And if you look at the slide, that's a lot of people. That fills Princess Street, 50,000 people. That's a very hard ship to turn around. But more importantly, 25 million pounds a year has now gone out of membership, subscription fees, gone with those 50,000 people. So the mountain, it's a big mountain. We get it's a big mountain, and you don't need me to tell you how big that mountain is. I moved back to Scotland about three years ago, and I, over on the west coast, and um, the local club to where I lived, I thought I might join. I hadn't been a member of a golf club for 20 years. Uh, and I looked at the proposition, it was 550 pounds to join the golf club, and that seemed like a reasonable sum. But then I looked at how much a round was gonna cost me, and it was 10 pounds. 10 pounds on a deal every day of the year. And it doesn't matter whether I like golf, don't like golf, or how I viewed the proposition. If you just from a cold commercial proposition, I knew I wasn't going to play 55 rounds a year. So was that worth doing? And that's the challenge. That's the challenge we've all got. And so what we need to do is help you with this solution. We need to enable you. And we need to give you the platform to try and make this a level playing field for everybody. You know, the smallest clubs, we want to give them the same foot up as the bigger clubs have. And we need to adopt to change. We all, every one of us, we accept change in a different way. You get early adopters. Then you get people who just want to wait and see how it goes and they might come a little bit later. But when you look at the businesses and the successful businesses around the world, every single one of them has adopted change and moved with the times. If they haven't, they're gone. I came into the golf business in 1991, and when you do the math, that makes me feel very old. I, I played a lot of golf as a kid. I'd had some great coaching from some great PGA pros. In the mid-80s, I was lucky enough to be coached by Bob Torrance, who was absolutely fantastic. But the idea as a young kid that you had to go for a playing interview to see if he would coach you was probably the scariest thing I'd ever done. I was a sales rep. I was tell selling Terry's chocolates around Scotland. And I saw an advert for Nike Golf looking for a rep. I thought, happy days. I can have my sport and have my job. So I applied. I got the job. I thought, how hard can it be? The biggest sports brand in the world, and all I've got to do is sell to golf clubs. That was my first mistake. The golf business is not an easy business. And so when you go back, this, that shoe on the, on the slide there, was actually the first athletic shoe that we brought to the market. And everywhere I went, I was told, even if I like the shoe, son, there is no way the committee's going to let it on. It's not going to happen. And it was hard. We had a few classic shoes. We had some bits and pieces that, w that were acceptable. But as a rule, this sports company coming into our niche business wasn't really, it, it wasn't very welcoming. So I was up and down the country, and it's, it's strange. All these years later, I can still remember that Gordon Gray at Dumfries and County Golf Club was the first person to buy Nike shoes from me. The fact that I can remember that now I can tell you how big a deal it was at the time. I just felt the monkey was off my back. But I was traveling the country, and it, it wasn't an easy sell. It really wasn't. 
But as a young kid, you start to see early adopters, people who think the way it might be in the future versus the way it is today. And I remember going to Aberdeen. I was told, go to Aberdeen, see Bruce Davison. He's got a good shot. So I went to King's Links, saw Bruce, and it was just a weird reception. He said to me, you got an application form? Just give me it. He filled it in there and then. And then he, he gave me a check for 3,000 quid. I said, don't you want to see the shoes? He said, no, not really interested. He says, all I know is that you're a big sports brand, and one day you'll get it right. And when you do get it right, I want to be one of the early adopters, and I want to be recognized as somebody who stocks the brand. And to me, that, it, was, it was an eye-opener for me. That's someone who had a bit of vision. He knew he was getting nothing out of it that day, but I bet he's one of the main Nike retailers in the Aberdeen area now. So we got a little bit of traction prior to actually having a golf division. We had back-to-back -back wins with Curtis Strange, but that was more just dipping the toes in, seeing if it would work. Phil Knight, the founder of Nike, didn't believe that golf was a sport. Golf was a hobby for fat old men, and he was not going to invest in that hobby until he met Tiger Woods. Then he realized that an athlete could become a golfer, and an athlete could change the face of golf. And if that's going to happen, I'm going to invest in that athlete. $25 million, opening contract. That was the biggest contract any golfer had had at that moment in time. And it paid off. He signs him in 1996, 1997. Tiger wins the Masters. Now Phil Knight's looking like a genius. He was an idiot six months before for offering the guy $25 million. And so the brand starts to create a little momentum. Worked out great for Tiger, worked out great for Nike. And I think he's been fantastic for the game. Absolutely fantastic. By that time, I was the sales director for Nike Golf in the UK. And I remember I got a phone call from a golfer one day. You never get a phone call from a pro golfer. The manager phones. And I should know that, because I managed Fowler for seven years, and I had to do all the phone calls. But I had a golfer, and I just thought, how strange. This guy said, I hear you make good golf shoes, and I hear they might be quite comfortable. And he said, do you mind sending me some shoes? Because I struggle with my feet a little bit. I said, sure. I think I sent him three pairs of golf shoes. Three months later, if my clicker works, there he is. Paul Laurie wins the Open in Nike golf shoes. The ultimate endorsement and the ultimate adoption for any brand is when somebody wins a major with product they chose to wear. Brands can't buy that exposure. But Paul's from Aberdeen, so as soon as that was finished, I had to pay him. But up until then, it was a fair deal. And then the brand, once the brands get momentum, then they start telling you, they start dictating, they stop asking the questions. None of these brands, Ricky Fowler's guys, they don't come knocking the door saying, hey, is it okay if I get my stuff on your golf course? They got power then. And they drive change. They don't ask. And that's what people like. That's what's exciting. Ricky Fowler is an exciting golfer. You look at the picture of Ricky there. He's got his kind of high top boots on. He actually looks like he's tagged. But uh, it's actually worse than that. He's double tagged. But he's got cuff trousers on. He's got basketball boots looking things on. And yet he's, he's an inspiration for the sport. And we, should, we, we embrace people like that. It's, it's the future, and it continues to be. Tiger, ironically, was a lot more conservative. Tiger used to wear wind socks. Nike didn't make those. They had to get them specially made. And he, he tried to be so conservative. So you, you need brands. I mean, it's Jason Day on the left there. You, you need guys that are just willing to go with the change. So I only wanted to share that story. It's a kind of an adoption story. I was there on, on, if you like, day one. Nobody wanted it. And now, it, eventually, adoption happened. It just happens at different times. So we look at the world we live in. We'll just move away from golf just for a little bit. Look at the world we live in. Number of years, thanks to Stuart Darling for this slide, the number of years it took 50 million users to engage with something. And look at that closely. The airline industry, 68 years before 50 million people got involved. Now, we need that. We need the cars. We rely on them for our everyday. But yet, Pokemon Go can do it in 19 days now. Who needs Pokemon Go? Apparently, 50 million people do in 19 days. But it's quite clear to see in this chart that it's where the internet kicks in is where everything speeds up. And that's where the game changing starts. How many of us in the room have got a smartphone? Come on, I'm only gonna do this once to you, hands up. Smartphones. 
Okay, how many has got that Nokia phone on the left-hand side? Go on, someone's going to do it. I knew he'd do it. I bet you haven't got it on you. He does. <laughs> Who planted him? All right, that's the bad. The thing is, he can't communicate with anyone. And we don't know when we actually made the change. Because we all had that Nokia phone. But now, all of a sudden, we've all got these other phones. But they're not phones. They're massively powerful computers. They're powerful communication tools. And we don't know. They, they just kind of made their way into our life. And it's the visionaries that do things like this to our life and change our life. You know, Steve Jobs didn't walk down the street with the Nokia phone and ask people what they'd like it to look like. Because they never would have come up with the phone that we live with today. Bear with me on this slide. Everything is, is, is in, in our lives, some of you are as old as me, things happen quickly. Look at Google, 1998, not that long ago, well, 20 years ago. How did they set themselves apart? If I said to people in the room, what's Google? It's a search engine. It's way more than a search engine. It's got under your skin, and you don't even know it. You want to translate something? Do it on Google. That's not looking something up. Google decided to do maps. Why would they do maps? Google Maps. We all use it. When you got the satellite view, the lovely HD satellite pictures, most of us probably would have started paying at that point. I don't mind 99 pence a month. I don't mind a pound a year. This is, this is good value. And then they took it a step further and spent hundreds of millions of pounds. They'll just drive cars up and down the street all over the world so that you don't have to worry about the satellite view. You can have a street view as well. We definitely would have all paid for that. Visionaries, absolute visionaries. So now, it's become vocabulary. You don't say to your friend, I'm going to World Wide Web it. And to the point, to the brand on the right, you also don't say, I'm going to Yahoo it. They didn't get with the momentum. Google did. They're under your skin. Facebook. 20-year-old kid comes on the scene. What rights he got to take over the world? MySpace came on the scene at a pretty similar time. A little bit of a battle going on between those two in the early days. News Corp bought MySpace for $580 million because they knew it was the future. They didn't know how to do it, so they'd buy it. They put some well-paid suits onto that because they knew this other kid was coming along and they were going to take him out. Forbes magazine will tell you, why did Facebook win and why did MySpace lose? because MySpace was going to determine what you all needed, because they were very well qualified and very rich. And the young kid decided, I'll let you decide. I'll give you options, and I'll be led by you. I'll be led by the people. He's got 2.2 billion users a month now. MySpace, News Corp, gave up the ghost pretty much in 2011. They were in for $580 million, and they sold it for $35 million. Lesson learned. Listen to the people. YouTube in there. Google was clever again. It bought YouTube very early. And people would say, well, it was a waste of money. How are you ever going to make money out of YouTube? Streaming times are poor. Data storage is massively expensive. How's that going to work? They had the vision. They knew storage was going to get cheaper. They knew streaming was going to get faster. So in 2017, Internet advertising spend past television spend. Without doubt, it's now the future. And it's increasing by over 20% a year. Facebook also had the vision. They bought WhatsApp and Instagram down the bottom there. They paid $19 billion for Instagram. Idiots. No. They paid a billion dollars uh, for Instagram. I think it said Instagram there. And then you look at the poor relation down on the right-hand side. I put that in deliberately. Because Kodak is something we all used throughout our life. 35 mil, then all of a sudden it was all the pain to kind of wind it on. Then they did it automatically. Everything was great. That was the future. Kodak refused to accept that digital was the way forward. They said they'll come back to us. Yeah, and this is where we need to take lessons for our 50,000. They said that it'll come back to us. By the time they knew they were wrong, it was too late. It was gone. They lost the opportunity. And to put that into perspective, 
1997, Kodak peaked at $16 billion a year of revenue. 2017, $1.7 billion of revenue. Slide that's gone. Instagram, in the first quarter of 2018, over $2 billion in revenue. They've won the day. Done. Choices. We all make choices. And we all make choices differently. You'll recognize yourself in that chart. 35,000 choices is what they reckon we make a day. 2,000 choices every waking hour, choice every two seconds. You're all making choices right now. Some of us impulsive, yeah, whatever. Whatever comes, I'll, I'll take it first. You're compliant, you delegate, you don't want the responsibility. But we're all, we all make choices. And industries know that. And industries change, everything can be changed by how people interact with you. Physical businesses. 1995, did we need another airline with EasyJet? No. Freddie Laker and all these guys, they're going out of business. Why would we need another airline? Because Stelios decided he's going to do it differently. Into Glasgow, 2999, the big 0800 number. Then he started coming into Edinburgh. Because his attitude was, no, no, I'll give you the choice. I'll give you the basic price of a seat. It's up to you if you want to bring a bag. Now it's up to you if you want to sit at the front of the plane. You want to sit in the emergency exit. Pay the extra. Go back to the 50 million user chart with the aeroplanes. Took them 67 years. It's taken him just over 20 years to get to 80 million users. Change the industry. You'd go into Glasgow Airport. Loads of people here will have done it. When they, when they launched, the business guy, he's going down to gate 18, 19, 20. He's a British Airways guy. The backpacker that goes off with EasyJet. Now, complete opposite. Everybody uses EasyJet to the extent that British Airways now pretty much mirror what EasyJet do. You pay for the bag, you pay for your food when you're on board, so the industry changed. Amazon, Stuart hit on Amazon last year, total game changer. It's not just a shop, it's not just an online shop. They're thinking ahead all the time. They've got 300 million users there. In America alone, Amazon sell 500, over 526 million different products. And as if that wasn't enough, they've got Amazon Prime, 100 million of us on Amazon Prime, happily paying $7.99 a month. Why? Because they just make it easy. We all just want what's easy. And then if, if, if you can't find what you want on Amazon, don't worry. If you buy it somewhere else, they'll give you Amazon Pay. You can still use your Amazon account somewhere else. 33 million of us do that. So it's ease. App on my phone, on my fingertips, how easy can this all be? I've only got... Ikea in there because it was quite an early sort of one, but I put the Ikea one down to the kind of Dragon's Den model, and I just wonder if any one of these three would have got through the Dragon's Den. And I can just see the pitch for Ikea where the guy goes, I'm going to have this big blue shed, huge. I have loads of furniture. Oh, well, it's just going to be the same as MFI. No, 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 no. It won't be MFI. I'll build a track, and they'll walk around the track, and they'll see all the stuff as they go around it. It'll all be built, and uh, yeah, that'll do. Yeah, but you'll need a shop assistant. You need quite a lot. Mm -mm. I'll just put out paper and pen. Make them write it down as they go. Oh, a little bit Argos-like. Oh, no, 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 no. Once they get to the end, I'll open up the warehouse. They can go and get it themselves. <laughs> 780 million of us willing to do it. Handing over 40 billion a year. They must have something right. Now, this is where we want to start thinking about how we're working with, with, with the golf clubs. These guys don't own anything. They're enablers. Biggest taxi company in the world, they don't own taxis. Facebook, the biggest content, one of the biggest media content providers in the world, they don't produce content. You produce the content for them. And Airbnb, they were determined that you would be willing to go and stay in someone else's house, and they just enable you. They would just hook you up with you, and it would work. You look at Travis on the right-hand side, he's a happy boy in that picture. He's a happy boy because he just found out he's worth seven billion. Mark Zuckerberg, when he floated it, he, 30 billion he's worth. He's now worth 54. So it was clearly a good deal for the stock exchange. Whoops. And our friends at Airbnb. A lot of people think that these tech guys, they just get it easy. They don't. Airbnb went through 20 rounds of venture capital funding just trying to get going, and they couldn't do it. They decided that they would get into the breakfast side. And, and do cereal. They did, they did celebrity cereals. They did Obamos, which are Cheerios, and Captain McCain's, trying to get into the whole Democrat scene. 
they actually sold cereal at $39.99 a box and sold enough to make $30,000 to keep the business going. Anything to keep it going, and it proved successful. So what's our offering? What are we going to do? Well, we want to enable you. We want to give you a platform for free to try and get everyone on the same page. Every, you know, we look at all those figures that I've just shown you, billions of people, billions of people. If we can just get tens of thousands of people on the same page, then that's going to help us all. Give or take our, our golfing population is just over 800,000, but it's been said a couple of times already today, the membership makes up about 21% of that. So why don't we just try and engage with 100%? Why don't we get 100% trying to help us pay all the bills? So into the details. What are we going to give you uh, from a, a platform point of view? The first thing is we're not taking commissions out of anything. So with regards to our booking platform, anything that is booked, you'll get 100% of the money. It's not going to be a tea time booking system. It's going to be a venue booking system. So you'll be, able to book, you'll be able at the back end to put what you want on it. Golf lessons, catering, functions, junior clubs, whatever it is. We're going to try and enable everything to be easier so people can just book things through an app, pay through the app. And you're going to see that with the tech guys in a short period of time. And the choice is 100% with the clubs with regards to the non-member affiliate, which basically means you can have the software for free, even if you don't want to open up competitions to the non-members that Andrew was talking about earlier with handicaps. The control is completely yours. This is an opportunity. It's not any kind of dictating from our side. It's an opportunity. That's for the golf clubs, and the guys are going to go into it in a little bit more detail. Golfer categories. So clearly there is a new category in the middle. With regards to members of golf clubs, everything through the app is going to be free. All access is going to be free. If you are a member of a golf club and you book a tee time at another golf club, you won't pay any booking fees. It'll be free for you to use. The new category. We're basically trying to move in, trying to embrace this 100% of the people and get into the Netflix world. People are happy paying small amounts regularly if they feel that there's value in it for them. So we'll charge these people $4.99 a month, and they will pay a slight premium on a booking fee. And they'll have access to competitions only where the golf clubs invite them. There's no right to come and do anything. It's where the golf clubs invite them. And the guys will come on to more on that in the tech. And realistically, going forward, we want national competitions for all golfers. We want everyone to be able to play in competitions. <coughs> and what would it mean? So I, I started the presentation talking about 50,000 golfers um, going away. I could turn around and use a number of 100,000. Wouldn't it be great if we did something with 100,000, 200,000 people? But 10,000 people, if we could just get the last two years of people who left membership to U-turn and come back the way. If they wanted a handicap, that would take 30,000 rounds of golf. Ballpark, three quarters of a million pounds going into the golf club's pocket on green fees. The affiliation fees, the money that would come to Scottish golf to be reinvested into the game. Per 10,000, you're looking at about 1.4 million, and that's if they only played those three rounds. That doesn't include any revenue for the rest of the year. So really, it, we want golfers to decide how they play the game. We want to embrace all golfers. But more importantly, the power remains with the golf club. It's your choice. It's your choice how you engage with this. So before I pass on to the tech guys, I'm going to be really cheeky. Some of you might have noticed we've got Paul Laurie in the room. And I just thought I'd see if he would be willing to come up and have a little chat with us. You want to come up, Paul? Come on then. Can we get my mic? Might take me a little bit of while because I've had a little bit of surgery, as you might know. But I'll get there eventually. Where's the crutch? The crutch is gone, thank God. <laughs> my kids are calling me hop along. This is clearly the informal part. Hurry up. The one thing you never mentioned about the shoes is you charged me for those shoes. I remember it very well. I didn't well. charge you. Yeah. 
tell you. All right, maybe, maybe I shouldn't. I'm a little bit intimidated because an Aberdeen fan, this is a lot of people, let me tell you. <laughs> How are you? Good. Can I sit down, sitting down or do standing you, up? Or? Do, you want, do you need to sit down? Oh, definitely. Oh, my God. I'm going to get a buggy when I play seniors tour, so are I may you? as well sit down. Right, come on. I do. Okay, so you've hobbled up here. Yeah. Why don't you give people a little bit of an insight into your foot, what you actually had done, how your co recovery's going, and uh, if you're going to get back out there. Well, I've got some, uh, I've got some videos on my foot, if you want to see them. No, the surgeon no, sent me a lovely no. video of the operation. Um, I had a ruptured tendon uh, on my foot and a torn ligament. So it's 10 weeks ago now, 10 weeks on Monday. Uh, so I'm getting there. Obviously, I've got the big boot off, which is nice, because that was, that was not pleasant, sitting six or seven weeks with a big boot on. I've always been quite an active uh, kind of person. I'm always here, there, and everywhere, and doing things, and involved in a lot of stuff. And then to be told to sit on your fat bum for six or seven weeks, you know, it was quite difficult. They don't call me patience for nothing. That's always been my nickname. <laughs> so uh, to have to do things and, and slow down and not go anywhere, and I couldn't drive my car, and oh, man, it's just been a bit. But I had to get it done. You know, I'd, I'd been struggling for about five years with my foot. So now uh, he's happy with what, how it's gone. He's happy that I can get back to playing golf uh, going forward from end of January. So I'm looking forward to it. It's been... Uh, a bit difficult, but man, you know, we all have things that we need to kind of get put up with. Yeah. Well, following on from the Open, you started your own management company. How's that going and who, who have you signed? Who have you got on board? Uh, well, first of all, uh, we look after uh, Sam Locke, who obviously won the silver medal at the Open last year. Sam was our first client. Uh, David Law, who got his card from the Challenge Tour last year. They're our two uh, main clients. Obviously, I do my own stuff. You know, I've done my own stuff for, for a long time. Um, and then my son Craig uh, obviously joined us as well. So we've got four of us uh, so far. Uh, Michael McDougall, who runs our foundation, is doing some bits and pieces with it as well. So Mikey's doing all the flights and, and all, the, all the bits and pieces. And I'm out there trying to sell some deals for the boys to you know, get them going. Yeah, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, it's good. It's a bit different. Um, I've had no, no tantrums from the golfers yet. You know, I've had a few tantrums myself over the years with management groups. Were you, were you groups, the perfect so client? I, uh, no, 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 I was a little bit hard going, as you would imagine. But... <laughs> You know, it's when you, when you do what we do and, you, and you're passionate about what you do, you know, sometimes that, that spills over, you know, whether you're, whether you're a good guy or not a good guy. Um, sometimes sport, it's a, it's a professional game and it's a, it's a game that you get uh, into. Um, but I'm enjoying it. You know, it's been good fun so far. Um, I wasn't sure if I could play, you know, anymore. So I wanted, uh, is, we've got a golf centre, obviously, that we're in Aberdeen, but I wanted something that I could be involved in and, my youngest son's at Sterling. He's doing business sport management at Sterling, so he wants to go into this sort of side of things. So Five Star was basically set up for Michael to do a little bit of the football and, and, and I would do the golf. So we'll give him the profit a little bit because you know, football agents make a few quid and I'll do the other bit. <laughs> well, listen, you're obviously passionate about junior golf. We've seen quite a lot about junior golf and Ross spoke quite a lot about it earlier on. Give us an update on the foundation. How, how's that been going over the last few years? You're obviously still heavily involved in junior golf. Foundation's good. Uh, it, it had a little dip uh, a few years ago with the oil price, obviously, in Aberdeen. That affected us hugely. We've got a lot of oil companies that are sponsors uh, of the foundation. So of the 18 sponsors we had for a while, we had 11 pull out, you know, pretty much at the one time. So that was obviously quite stressful to try and keep the money coming in and keep the money going. My wife and I are hugely involved in it. Uh, Marion's at every event. And uh, I'm, I'm obviously, when I'm home, I'm always at the events and speaking to the kids and trying to encourage them. And... Uh, the kids are great, you know, the kids have always been great, you know, in the foundation. They, they buy into what we're trying to do, we're trying to get them to have fun. We're trying to make the, the golf courses a little shorter for them, a little easier. Uh, the tees are, are well forward. Uh, we play holes of 175 yards of a maximum for the kids, so they're not struggling away and, and you can throw it out of a bunker if you're in there for too long. And I think, you know, it just takes a bit of time. I mean, we've been going since 2001. And we've looked after thousands of kids in that time. Uh, David Law has been in since he was 13, and he's now on the tour. So, you know, we're having some success, but, you know, it takes, it takes a little bit of time. And uh, the biggest thing for us, I heard Ross saying that I think the idea is we need to ask kids, you know, more often uh, what, what, how we need to change it. And we do that a lot at the foundation, and dress code is always the thing that right. is the answer I get. The old kids always say, well, I don't want to change to, to play golf. I want to come in my, in my kind of clothes that I wear when I'm in the house. So that's something that we've obviously got no dress code in the foundation. I think there's been a huge difference on that. They're now bringing their little sisters who didn't used to play golf and little brothers. So that's always something that we try and kind of encourage. Uh, we want them to come and have fun. 
and play golf and get into it. I mean, I, I've obviously I'd loved, you know, being involved in golf all my time, and we're just trying to pass that passion uh, on to the next generation. But it's, it's tough, you know. It's, you're up against iPhones and mm. iPads and computers, and you know, it's not easy. Uh, and the numbers are down a wee bit to, to where they were a few years ago. But obviously, there's a pile of us working pretty hard, and I think we're we're getting there. Well, like a, a lot of people in, in the room here, obviously, you know, running a golf club is a hard thing. And passion and labour and love for a lot of people. You've got a golf club. Is it easier for you because you're Paul Laurie, or is it still a challenge to run a golf club? No, it's, uh, it's uh, hugely uh, challenging. Uh, obviously, no matter who, who you are, uh, the golf industry has not gone through the best of times and hasn't done for a long, long time. Our facility currently runs a slight loss uh, every year and has done for a wee while. Uh, you obviously, we have a lot of people that work very hard and a lot of talented people who work with us. And We've recently become an SGU affiliate club, so you can have yeah. a handicap with us now. We've put in a couple of tees to have two par fours and seven par threes, so you can play a medal now with us, and that's helped a little bit. But again, we only had something like 28 or 29 new members when we put that in. So, it, you know, it's a little bit of a struggle. And, uh, you know, interesting, obviously, from before, from Andrew mentioned the the people that are not members of a club being able to have a handicap for a club like us. You know, if you're, if you're saying that we can lay on a competition and we can have 40 or 50 new golfers playing a green fee every week for us, that could be the difference. You know, for mm -hmm. us, it's a lot of money for a golf club that loses money. Um, but, you know, like they also said, you know, change is, change is not easy. You know, mm -hmm. change is difficult. I'm, I'm nearly 50 and, you know, my kids are smarter than me and cleverer than me and tell me that every day. So we've got to listen to them as to what, you know, what they want. But... The golf centre is great fun. I enjoy it, you know, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make money at the moment. Mm. But that's obviously something that we're trying to get it towards. And at the moment, it loses a little bit. Yeah, you had a sneaky preview at the app earlier on, and you can see what we're mm. trying to do. Is it something that? Yeah, I'm being really cheeky now. Is that something that you would have at the Paul Laurie Golf Centre? Do you think in the future? Firstly, I like how you've written out some questions, and I never even knew it was coming up here today. It's quite, quite cool, isn't it? He's got a little well, list of questions wing it. there. I had to wing it. Yeah, I had a wee look at the app, obviously, when we're sitting at the table, and, oh, man, it's just phenomenal, you know, what you've been able to do w with that. And obviously, Lee, I've known for a little bit of time, and uh, for, a go for a place like us, a golf centre like us, you know, we're now going to have this app, and it's going to be free for us to use to get people in about. I mean, who's not going to... Who's not going to want that, you know, as a golf club? And I'm sure you're going to wait to show it to everyone yeah. now, and... You know, you're going to be blown away with what you're going to see. We certainly, as a golf centre, will be using it and we'll be embracing it to try and turn the corner for us. I think it will. Well, listen, I really appreciate you coming up. I think I've kind of overrun and overstayed my welcome here. So what I'm going to do, um, we're going to mosey off, and I'm going to invite Lee Prober and Joe Persh from uh, OCS to come up and really show you what they've built so far and show you what we see as a digital future. So thank you for listening.